After the Z Fighters refuse this biker girl's offer of lollipops, the woman introduces herself as Auburn, though neglects to give any sort of surname. She claims to be a time traveler from the future and tells of an android threat which would appear within three years. The various fighters there don't believe such a story, and Raditz haughtily claims to be strong enough to defeat any threat coming their way. Careful there, big boy. I may not be as good at it as my dad, but I can see when someone's not telling the truth. And what you just said right there is nowhere close to what you actually believe, is it? Auburn put a hand on her hip and then powered up, flashing into Super Saiyan. She smirked once the others all went slack-jawed, pulling her shades down just enough to reveal those teal eyes. Does this help show you just how powerful these androids are? The others are simply dumbfounded. How is there another Saiyan alive? And how did they know Super Saiyan, let alone use it so easily? Goku immediately challenges the girl to a fight, and she hesitantly agrees. By this point, Raz is powered down, but Goku uses a Super Saiyan form without issue, and manages to stalemate with Auburn, finding her to be a pretty potent combatant, though much less refined than he was. In fact, she seemed to dislike fighting, or perhaps she had a more cautious style of fighting, much closer to Raditz. With that said, Auburn decides to go into more details regarding what will happen as the androids are just one facet of what caused the future warriors to fall. First off, there's a mysterious doctor, other than Jiro, trying to create new lifeforms known as bio-warriors. He's the one who strikes first, and his army of genetically modified creatures only serves to weaken Earth's heroes, eventually leading to Piccolo falling and the Earth losing its Dragon Balls. From there, Jiro attacks with his androids, and the rest is history. So, Auburn's advice would be to keep Piccolo safe and make sure Goku takes his medicine, as that still happens as per usual. The idea of finding Jiro is thrown out, but Vegeta and Goku both say that'd be boring, and Raditz just can't go against his baby brother. Aside from this little debriefing, the female Saiyan walks over towards Turnip, who's been glossy-eyed this whole time. I know you never really been the hugging type, so what about a fist bump? Auburn put her fist up, which Turnip tentatively returned. The two have a quiet conversation, which leads the others to hypothesize about just who this hybrid belongs to. Between Turnip's bigger stomach and the two speaking in hushed tones, it's not too hard to figure out. The others wonder what the future holds for them, and especially Gohan, who is definitely older than Auburn, at least in the future. But whenever the question is posed, the girl goes silent and refuses to answer, simply saying that she'll change the future. She hands the heart medicine to Goku and tells Raditz to not be a coward and make sure he can protect everyone. With that, she enters the time machine nearby and goes back to the future. The various sea fighters wonder how they'll possibly be able to destroy the future threat, though Goku and Vegeta seemingly have no fear regarding the warning. Both Raditz and Turnip seem rather perturbed with this news, and Krillin seems to walk off with Bulma, requesting something of her before asking to train with Goku. Yamcha wants to as well, though Krillin questions whether he could handle having his body tearing itself apart during training, and the Desert Bandit says he'll, you know, just do some training on his own. Yeah, that'll be enough, Yamcha, don't worry. With that, everyone goes their separate ways, with Vegeta promising to surpass both of the low-class brothers by the time the androids arrive. Whilst heading home, Bulma wonders how she could possibly track down the mysterious doctor who made the Bio-Warriors. Well, if she had to guess, he likely had a secret lair just like Jiro and many other great scientists. However, once she got back to Capsule Corp, her father was waiting outside, greeting her in a rather hysterical manner. He was yelling about something the Cybermen had done, something about growing larger and fusing or merging in some way. 
Well, they hadn't done much other than drink water and sleep in the past few months since being, you know, jumped by the biomen, so Bulma was curious as to what this meant for them. She stepped into the sub lab beneath Capsule Corp and gasped as she saw a giant seven or so foot Cyberman. Well, at least it looked somewhat similar to a Cyberman. It had horns, which upon further inspection were rather smooth and almost had flowers at the end. Perhaps these horns were more like stems. Its head, while still rather large, was now fashioned to look a little closer to humanoid, though pink hair-like petals now flowed out of what used to be the acid gland it once had. It also had human-like hands, though its feet stayed as their original three-clawed variant. It seemed to be aware of the fact that Bulma had entered the sublab, despite the observation room having a one-way mirror. D Dr. Briefs, n nice to meet you. Please, wish to see you in person, it said. Now, the scientist certainly knew this creature was something else, but the Cybermen had never previously shown a proclivity for speech, hardly able to even understand it. In fact, the sprouts were closer to dogs than humans, understanding the tones of speech rather than the actual words themselves. But this one, it was fascinating. Part of the scientist figured this was a ploy to eat her or something, but she also knew if this thing wanted to escape, it certainly could. She hesitantly opened the lab door and came face to face with her experiment. You are as bright as the s sun, Dr. Briefs. We, I, I've become what my kind call an iramin, the second stage in our l life cycle to a degree. This was fascinating, though Bulma was curious how the iramin knew any of this. When questioned, it said it just sort of knew things, Though its body was still young and it was acclimating to speech, explaining its way of speaking. Well, Bulma would happily help it out, though it'd have to help her understand exactly what it was. Hmm, uh, I accept. As for what uh, I am, who I am, a creature made through inos inosculation think Sukatsu works. Bulma initially spends weeks studying the Iramin, or Sukatsu as it called itself. To her knowledge, they were pretty powerful, though didn't rival Vegeta, being far closer to Yamcha's power level, though possessed a natural curiosity that extended even to the martial arts. Bulma herself taught it how to speak in a more, you know, normal way, though it still had a habit of using plant terminology knowing full well most people wouldn't understand. This new hyperfixation took Bulma by storm, so much so that when Krillin stopped by, asking if she had figured out where the mysterious scientist was, she had to admit it had slipped her mind. Krillin, despite usually being a goofball, was irritated about this, saying King Kai would be disappointed if he knew she had dropped the ball. Well, they still had close to two years to find them, so he'd be in touch. The chestnut was about to leave when he spotted a giant plant watering some nearby trees on Capsule Corp grounds. The scientist introduced the two, admitting she had kept him a secret from everyone aside from Yamcha and Vegeta, who were both trying to train in the gravity chamber with, you know, some success on Yamcha's part. Well, Krillin was happy Sokatsu was on their side, though wondered if it'd actually be able to fight when the time came. Oh well, Krillin simply said goodbye and flew off to Kame House to see his old mentor. Goku and Raditz likewise decided to take some time off from training so hard as both they and Gohan had gotten some pretty solid gains in the past year. Goku decided to show Raditz all of the places he had visited during the Red Ribbon Saga, since they were presumably going to fight them again. Once rolling up to Jingle Village and being introduced to Aider and Suno, well, let's just say Raditz's Saiyan blood began to boil. 
Something the Saiyan had always thought was that while Kakarot was more of Bardock's son than he was, Raditz was always closer to Gine. The whole time they were hanging out with Suno, she was giving off some serious Gine vibes. She was incredibly nice and personable, unlike the feisty Chi-Chi and cold or callous Turnip. Despite this, the girl could really hustle, quickly chopping firewood for the furnace and cooking a meal fit for a Saiyan army. The Saiyan never believed in love, at least not in the traditional sense, but memories from long ago, ones only dredged up by this interaction, popped into his mind. Stories of how Gide had met and fallen for Bardock, despite Saiyan society not really promoting such romantic encounters. Now, aside from any romantic interest in Suno, Raditz had also never really gotten to have any, shall we say, promiscuous encounters, since he had grown up on a planet of asexual slug people. The Saiyan could really use a distraction from all the training and seriousness of the upcoming threat. Besides, he also had some issues with Super Saiyan that he had been dodging whenever Goku asked to train in the form. And so, between training sessions and dodging Goku trying to train in Super Saiyan, Raditz visited Suno. At first, he used the excuse that he really didn't have a place to stay and offered to do things around the village in order for lodging. Well, Ader often stayed on the couch, but they did have a storage shed that had a cot in it. Raditz took it and ended up staying in Jingle Village for quite some time, flying between there and Mount Pauzu to train. The residents there began to look to Raditz for help whenever any sort of small disaster occurred, or they just needed his brute strength for large projects, and the Saiyan became something of a local hero to them. Suno and Raditz also grew closer, though the Saiyan had a hard time actually playing the dating game as he had never even thought about such a thing. Overall, it took about a year, but eventually Suno invited him into the house one incredibly cold night and the two started a more adult relationship. During this time, Krillin and Goku had noticed the older Saiyan slacking off a little, but the two continued their training, the chestnut actually able to push Goku in his Super Saiyan state when using Kaioken times 20. The two trained often, akin to when they were children, though both were a little more serious now. Krillin had changed the most, his time with King Kai showing the martial artist that he had become strong in order to protect the lives the Kai worked so hard to create and preserve. Seeing what King Kai dealt with every day really gave Krillin a new outlook on life and how, weak as he was, he could work to change things. Aside from that, Gohan had progressed far more than anyone could imagine. Despite never unlocking Super Saiyan and being so young, he was almost as strong as Krillin when he used Kaioken. After another year of training, the trio had increased their gains by tenfold, including Raditz, though he was still hesitant to use Super Saiyan, despite having full control over it. The Saiyan somewhat feared the transformation, and Krillin could understand why after witnessing what happened on Namek. Heck, whenever Goku utilized the transformation, it made Krillin a little anxious. Luckily, it had little effect on the earthly Saiyan's mind. Well, either way, the group seemed strong enough to take on any threat that came to Earth, and with Bulma reporting that she had found a structure up north, well, Krillin figured this was their chance to take out the mysterious doctor before he could soften them up for Jiro. Once the trio began flying out that way, along with Bulma and Tsukatsu, well, let's just say that some alarms went off. Raditz, who had just woken up and was preparing to meet up with Kakarot, suddenly found Piccolo and Tien standing outside his and Suno's house. The Saiyan was curious about where they had been these past couple years, though was suspicious of Piccolo's intentions, remembering what happened prior to Namek. This suspicion was well placed as before he knew it, both of them began throwing hands. Luckily, Raditz was far stronger than these combatants, though they definitely weren't going easy on the training. Tien whipped out the four witches technique whilst Piccolo shot out a light grenade. While Raditz could tank such an attack, the collateral damage would be too much, so he flashed into Super Saiyan and smacked the attack away from the village. Just what's gotten into you two? Don't tell me this one's gotten into your head, Tien! 
the two remained silent, stoic, simply staring Raditz down. So that's it, huh? Fine, let's go somewhere a little more secluded at least. The trio flew off towards a glacial wasteland, but instead of Raditz thinking he had led these two here, it seemed he was the one who had been trapped. Three other warriors were lying in wait, along with a platoon of biomen. Raditz, ever the cautious Saiyan, was about to tactically retreat, but when the entire group jumped him, there wasn't much he could do. Despite being more powerful than any individual warrior, he couldn't handle them all and was eventually pinned down and frozen. Only minutes later, Krillin and the others arrived on the scene. They sensed what had gone down but couldn't stop it in time as multiple biomen and unformed bio warriors had intercepted them. Luckily, Bulma had located the lab using sonar technology, and it seemed the bio warriors weren't quite ready for the final battle. Once they found the entrance to this secret base, Bulma split off from the group since she was currently carrying trunks with her. After dodging several traps and even some poison gas, the group found themselves surrounded by an army of biomen. While Krillin and Goku were more than ready to fight, Sukatsu was greatly angered at this sight. Pounding his fists into the ground and summoning hundreds of vines to pierce several of the converted Cybermen, creating flowers and other plant life from their corpses. You three continue on without me. I must find the progenitor of these saplings and make it wither away. With that, Tsukatsu flew down a separate hallway. The others flew down the main hallway, one which basically pointed towards the main scientist where they could sense Piccolo, Tien, Raditz, and several other fighters. Once busting through a giant bulkhead door, the group were surprised to see hundreds of tanks cultivating bio-warriors within them. Across the room, Raditz was floating within some cultivation fluid as well, having several wires and other apparatuses strapped to his body, feeding a giant computer information. Ah, oh, Goku and Krillin, the Earth's greatest warriors. You've arrived just in time to witness my latest batch of bio warriors, now utilizing the Saiyan power of Raditz himself. The doctor pressed a button, draining the fluid from every tank within the room and releasing an army of bio warriors, all of which stared down the group and prepared for a fight. But that's where we're going to leave things off for right now. If you enjoyed this part, I'd appreciate you guys jumping the like button with your homies or maybe even using the subscribe button's DNA to empower your abhorrent abominations. But even if you don't, thank you for getting to this part of the video and if you want to see another series with Cybermen lore, you should check out this video to the right. Now, you guys have a good day or night wherever you are. That's it for now. Bye bye.